Welcome back to Mirror University. I'm your host, AJ, and today we're going to talk about dirty bombs. Let's get into it. First and foremost, let's talk about what a dirty bomb is and what a dirty bomb isn't. A lot of times, people get confused between a nuclear device and a dirty bomb, as they are somewhat similar, but not exactly. You see, a nuclear bomb, when it explodes, it emanates a large thermal blast, destroying structures and also emanating a large mushroom cloud. A dirty bomb is more made to disperse radioactive material around an area without that thermal blast. Most times their construction consists of an explosive material and then on the outer surrounding part of it is going to be radioactive pellets or another irradiated type of material. The idea behind a dirty bomb is mass disruption, whereas a nuclear device is engineered to create mass destruction amongst the population. When a dirty bomb is utilized, the local population is going to be massively disrupted as news reports flood the airwaves and conflicting information is sent out. One important distinction that must be understood between a nuclear device and a dirty bomb is their method of detonation. Whereas a dirty bomb is going to use a conventional explosive to spread its radioactive pellets or other material, a nuclear device is simply splitting an atom and causing a nuclear explosion, sending thermal shock waves through the air up to 30 miles, causing massive destruction of infrastructure and structures. to note about dirty bombs is that they can be extremely small, they can be well concealed, and placed in inconspicuous areas, much like an improvised explosive device. The first step is recognizing that a bomb of this type has been detonated, and that radiation is present at the scene of the explosion. When dealing with a dirty bomb, while the initial explosion is hazardous to those nearby, the real threat comes from the radioactive material spread from those conventional explosions throughout a population. Depending on weather conditions, the dust and smoke from a dirty bomb can travel for miles unimpeded. It can affect local water supplies, get itself into local HVAC systems, spreading it inside of buildings, and also get all over the general populace. While we all know that radiation is something we'd prefer to not have around us in high amounts, it's important to understand why that radiation is so dangerous. First off, we can't see it, we can't smell it, and we can't taste it. So when we're in the presence of it, we might not even know which is why it's important to have tools on hand like a Geiger counter to make sure that we are aware of elevated radiation levels around us. Two important factors to note. We need to understand our time and proximity in regards to exposure to a dirty bomb. We wanna note where we were when we first became aware of the explosion. We also wanna note how long we may have been inside of that exposed area. This is important. Later on, this may aid decontamination efforts and also aid in medical diagnosing of any chronic ailments. The Fukushima and Chernobyl disasters are excellent examples of how a local population was affected by a radiological event. In 2011, the Fukushima reactor in Japan was hit by a tsunami spurned by an earthquake. The resulting power loss and electrical damage caused the failure of backup generators for the main core's water cooling pumps. This resulted in a full meltdown of the Fukushima reactor. The explosion blew apart the frame at the top of the building, apparently without damaging the containment building. Radioactive elements not yet trapped in the wet well suppression pool were released into the environment. In the four days following the tsunami, the four reactors were damaged by explosions and three of them with core melt. Following the reactor meltdowns, 160,000 people from the surrounding areas were required to be evacuated. One year later, radioactive debris from the Fukushima tsunami washed upon the shores of California, showing the reach of these disasters. When facing a radiological threat, we have two options. Number one, we can shelter in place. Buildings are an excellent way to stop radiation from getting in. However, it is recommended to get into a basement if at all possible. Now, if wind conditions permit, and you are well informed with your Geiger meter and you are able to get away from any kind of radiological event, that is the first thing that you want to do. However, if we do decide that it's time to evacuate, we also have to take into consideration the road conditions. 
If traffic is absolutely abysmal and we're hoofing it on foot, wind can catch up to you quick. So there's a lot to consider and we need to be very, very meticulous with our planning. If all else fails, shelter in place. The main takeaways here are that we want to minimize our exposure to radiation, maximize our distance from the exposure, and make sure that we are shielding ourselves from exposure and inhalation of radioactive particles. One of the best ways to do that is to have a comprehensive set of gear, just like the kind we have here. First and foremost, the NBC77 filter. This will filter out all known seaburn agents, including radioactive particles. Next, a high quality gas mask like the CM7M here, ensuring that we have potassium iodine to protect our thyroid from exposure. A Geiger meter, so we can test the radiation again. If you find radiation in sieverts higher than 0.03, start considering your options. And last but not least, our mop suit. With extreme breathability via activated carbon spheres, this will protect you from not just radiological disasters, but any other perceived seabrine threats as well. Breathable, offering high protection, and the highest quality you can buy. Make sure to consider these items when building your survival kit. Thanks for joining us today with Mirror University. If you'd like to see more, make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, stay savvy, survivalists.